You are watching the press preview of First Look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. It's time to see what's making the headlines with Conservative Home's Deputy Editor, Henry Hill, and the Daily Mirror columnist, Susie Boniface. They'll be with us from now until just before midnight. So let's see what's on some of those front pages for you now. Rishi Sunak's apology to the people of Rochdale after George Galloway took the seat in a by-election is front page lead for the eye. And the PM's pledge to stop the extremists that he says are determined to tear Britain apart leads the Express. The headline, we'll beat this poison. His words, uh, democracy under threat, makes the main headline in the Daily Telegraph. The warning of a threat to democracy is also the angle taken by tomorrow's Guardian. While the Times quotes his plea that we need to banish this hatred from our streets. In the mail, commentator Quentin Letts tells readers Rishi delivers a speech Britain needed to hear. The Financial Times reports that Elon Musk is suing the software firm OpenAI, alleging they failed to make good on a promise to make artificial intelligence technology freely available to the public. And the star has the story of the uh, horse being used by Greater Manchester Police to deter criminals uh, because of his flatulence. A reminder that by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's newspapers while you watch us. And we are joined tonight by Henry Hill and Susie Boniface. Welcome to both of you. Um, let's start with uh, Sunak's speech, which um, had everybody of a tiz uh, late afternoon because the, the lectern was outside Downing Street and it seemed um, ominous. What did he have to say, basically, Susie? I wasn't really listening because I was so busy shouting at my television <laughs> saying, how dare you, having, having stoked and created so much division and hatred and othering of foreigners and saying it's all somebody else's fault somewhere. He's now sitting there as Prime Minister, who's literally in charge of the country, saying, well, the country's going to rack and ruin, chaps. I don't know whose fault it is. We need to be nicer to each other. We need to show more compassion and empathy. I'm not aware of any time that his government has shown compassion and empathy towards anyone, anywhere. I mean, we've got Lee Anderson. He can't even... This Prime Minister can't even say why what Lee Anderson said about Sadiq Khan was wrong. And here he is saying, well, we've got to be nicer to people. Well, he has said it was wrong. I mean, they all have said it was wrong. He can't even say that saying that a, a Muslim mayor of London has given... Um, is mates with Islamists, fundamentalist terrorists, that that is... that is saying that a person of one particular culture is responsible for the terrorists who... who um, who, who exploit and pervert that culture. And if you said that about a Jewish mayor and, and the Netanyahu government, it would be ragingly anti-Semitic. If you said it about anyone or anything, it would be awful. And he just can't find a way to say... He can't even accept a, a definition of Islamophobia for his own party. And yes, we've got problems, but you live by the sword and you die by the sword. And the, and the party which has created this whole atmosphere for years now is the one that he leads. So I didn't hear what he said. I was so busy being cross. Henry, is that right? Has his party created the atmosphere that he's now saying we need to, to get rid of? Uh, I don't think he can take the blame for all of it. Um, we do have a real problem in this country with um, Islamist extremism on the one hand and far-right extremism. And the conserv some Conservative politicians, such as Lee Anderson, have contributed to that. But, you know, this is by no means a problem that has been conjured up by the government. It is responding to a very real problem. I think the thing that slightly baffled me about Rishi Sunak's speech is that the sentiment is very good, but where are the policies, right? It's all very well to come out and put the lectern out, and, yeah, I had a heart attack when I saw the lectern until I, you know, worried that there was mid-early election. Um, but you need to back this up. You're in government, you've got a majority. What policies are you going to bring forward to do this? Police reform? Like, prosecution reform? Like, what? And there was nothing there. And I think that that's the really Well, nothing concrete. Thing. He did say in the speech that they would back the, the police up. Yeah, well, yeah, well, who, 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 but who says the opposite? What Prime Minister is going to come out and say, well, I'm not going to back the police? The, the, they have given the police some extra powers, but I think when you're the Prime Minister, if you're leader of the opposition, you know, fine, this kind of speech can do. But I think if you're the Prime Minister, then you should come out and say, we're going to do X, Y, Z. You should have this stuff in the pipeline, because Galloway's victory was horrible. 
But the problems that we're describing are not new. Galloway is a symptom of a problem that has been bubbling away in this country for quite some time. Yet we read in the mail, Susie, well, it's the opinion of, of Quentin Letts in, in his editorial, that um, the, the speech was much needed and uh, was particularly on point. Yeah, let me read something to you. This situation's gone on long enough. Our great achievement in building the world's most successful multi-ethnic, multi-faith democracy is being deliberately undermined, says an unelected prime minister. We would all like to have a better and healthier democracy, and the best way of doing it is to call a general election, which everyone hoped you were doing this afternoon. You know, to have um, someone who's an MP, like the MP for South West Norfolk, former Prime Minister of this parish, who was at the fringe Republican event uh, convention in the States, was talking to conspiracy theorists, and where the, people were actually throwing Nazi salutes at that conference. Uh, and refusing to point out that Tommy Robinson was a vicious, nasty racist. And he can't even withdraw the whip from her. I mean, I agree with Henry. There's nothing in this speech that has any clear policy. There's nothing that he announced that hasn't already been announced and also isn't really vague and useless and isn't going to tackle this. You mm. either have to say, I'm going to be very, very tough and I'm going to crack down on this, that or the other, or you have to say, we all just need to be nicer and more friendly or whatever it might be. But to pretend he's doing something when he's not doing anything and then to say, well, it's all someone else's fault. I don't know who on earth did this when he has blown the immigration and race dog whistle and allowed Home Secretary after Home Secretary to do that as well, just in order to score a few points in the polls, I find utterly disgusting, very hypocritical, and I'm just... I'm just I can't even... Oh, I can't even bear the fact that someone who can, who can do that can come out of Downing Street and look us all in the eye and talk very seriously and very meaningfully. And obviously, I think, probably genuinely cares and feels this stuff, and he still doesn't know what he's done and what Suella right. Braverman's done and what Liz Truss has done. He doesn't but, get but, it. But, but, but the conservative, conservative policies on immigration, which is a, you know, a perfectly legitimate policy area, given it was almost three-quarters of a million last year, is not the reason that we have a problem with... a serious problem with anti-Semitism. Right? Like, I can see maybe the drawing a connection that... between that and the far-right stuff, but there is a real problem here among certain elements of certain communities and certain groups, and that is not the Conservative government's fault. That is not... They, they are not triggered no. by talking but, but about immigration. The they hate off, Jews. What lets the lid off hate from all sides is, um, is when the politicians in the mainstream start othering and start pointing the finger and start saying, well, it's all that person's fault over there and they're not like us and they don't have British values. And that kind of rhetoric gets into daily life and someone else goes, well, yeah, it's about the values of my community. And then that all comes out. But, but, but and although that stuff, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, might be there anyway, right? It is, British society, for sure. yes. But when the mainstream lets the lid off it, just to score a few points in the polls somewhere, then it just blows up and it blossoms and people start saying stuff and doing stuff in every street and mm. every pub and it goes mad and it's because of the, the, the rhetoric and the divide and the, the fact that emotion has taken over our politics. But politicians can't Brexit. ignore this stuff, right? They have, they, they, politicians yeah, they have, have to talk about it. They have to discuss it sensibly and to discuss it in such a way and to say not to talk about a peaceful protest march as a mob to differentiate between a mob and peaceful protest. But, but just to say, the Prime Minister did also talk about um, Muslim Britons, as well as the, the Jewish community, um, highlighting the threat against both, both communities, didn't yeah. he? But he's, yeah, but he won't, you know, he won't withdraw the whip from Liz Truss. For, or won't even say that she should have said Tommy Robinson's a horrible human being. Uh, it took him ages to withdraw the whip from Lee Anderson. And he still can't say what it is that the problem is, and he still won't adopt an Islamophobia. Uh, definition, which his own party want him to adopt. And he just doesn't seem to get the difference between what he's saying and what he's actually in charge of. And, to be honest, he's in charge of the country. If he wants to say, we're not doing that anymore, we're going to stop blowing that dog whistle, we're going to focus... Whatever they say in the focus group is the way to win an election, no, we're going to be responsible and we're going to say this and that and we're going to play it a certain way. And we're going to be strong. We don't want any more Tory MPs having people turn up to their house with protests. We want it to just calm down, everything to be cooler and more civilised, which is what his speech was about. He's saying we all have a role to play, and yet he's not doing that. Mm. He's not doing any of that. Uh, he also spoke about the, the, the shock and fright at the George Galloway victory, the eye uh, looking at that, and the apology from uh, Sir Keir Starmer, Henry. Uh, yeah. It, it's... Um, Galloway... It, it, it's shocking. He's, it's not shocking as in, as in surprising, because Galloway is a for whatever else he is, and he's many things, a formidably good campaigner. 
And I think this is the third time that he has been returned to the House of Commons at the head of a tiny party that's basically him. Um, and this by-election was basically the perfect circumstances for him because it was in a seat during which uh, Gaza was a huge issue and there wasn't even a, effectively an official Labour candidate mm. because Labour had to withdraw. And I think that Starmer is right to the extent that because there wasn't a Labour candidate, that probably played a huge role in why he won. And the reason there wasn't a Labour candidate is because Labour allowed an anti-Semitic conspiracy theorist to become their candidate. Mm. So this is a good apology. I hope Labour will take Rochdale back at the general election. I expect so. But the, the, the focus here is not Galloway, I don't think. The focus is how did Labour... Because in other circumstances, that man would have entered Parliament as a Labour MP with everything that he believed. And that is, I think, the problem that really needs to be tackled. Because as Susie says, it's one thing to have these people out on the fringes, they'll always be there, but the main parties have a responsibility to police their candidates' lists and make sure that they don't become a vehicle for this kind of politics entering the House of Commons. Susie, how significant is it that uh, Galloway has won this this Well, season? look, there's only one George Galloway, mercifully, so he's, <laughs> unless he's not going to stand in all 650-odd constituencies, everyone else should be OK. But, um, and like Henry said, come the general election, he's probably going to get booted. But um, the issue really is, I, mean, I was speaking to someone who's in part of the Watchdale Labour Party today, who said that at the, the meeting that selected Azhar Ali, some time before he got found out, um, there was a lot of sudden new members of the Labour Party who were from the Muslim community who had joined the Labour Party in order to get Azhar Ali selected, was, was his belief. And if that's the case, that is exactly the kind of sort of entryism we saw under Corbyn. And... All right, it may have just caused us, something really weird has happened in Rochdale, but if that, as it was under Corbyn, becomes organised and spreads to other constituencies, then Starmer's got a big problem. One of the things that he did when he took over the party was to try to change some of the machinery so this stuff wasn't possible, but yet it happened with Azar Ali. And they didn't... He was a candidate for a hell of a long time before journalists found what he'd been up to, and they should have, they should have found him out sooner. And he shouldn't even been on the shortlist so that any new sudden members of the Labour Party had a right to vote, you know, in less than a week or whatever it was that they joined in order to get him on the, on, the, on the ballot. So there has to be far more checks, I think, on the internal party machinery that allowed him to get that far, because that should, that should never yeah. have happened. But obviously that, that uh, entry is in the... Anecdote that you've told us is is just uh, that we have yes we have no evidence of it. Susie and Henry for the moment. Thank you. We're going to take a break. Coming up, uh, we'll tell you why one chapter of the Women's Institute has swapped cream teas for the Bee Gees. When we come back, stay with us. Welcome back. You are watching the press preview. Still with me, Henry Hill and Susie Boniface. Now we're going to have a look at the Telegraph um, and uh, this story regarding uh, Grant Shapps, the Defence Secretary, who's demanding, we read, that uh, Jeremy Hunt to raise defence spending to 2.5% of GDP. That's in the, the budget, upcoming budget. Yep, Will he so, get his demand? Well, this happens before every budget and every autumn statement. There's someone at the Ministry of Defence who will say, well, we know we need more cash, otherwise yeah. we're none, no one's going to be able to fight and we'll have no tanks and Russia will invade. Uh, and they usually get told no, and then they have to make cuts somewhere else. Now, the NATO target for defence spending, I think, is about 2%. We currently spend 2.2% and Shaps is asking for 25 mm -hmm. So you don't have to hit that in order to keep your allies happy, although some of our allies are spending more like Germany and stuff because of the war in Ukraine, and arguably we're not spending quite enough. The problem is that the Ministry of Defence's procurement arm generally spends 20 grand on a spanner and it can't be trusted to spend any of its money wisely or properly, and so the Treasury, it looks like they're going to say no, because there's this is a brilliant quote in here from a Treasury source saying, a strong armed forces requires a strong economy, <laughs> which of course we don't have. So it's like saying, get lotted, uh, Mr Shapps, without saying it in quite so many words. I don't think he's going to get it. Henry? Uh, no, I mean, that, that is entirely true. Um, Jeremy Hunt is desperately scrabbling around trying to find room for tax cuts, uh, and we're reading that he's finding less and less room by the day, so the odds that he's going to find a load of cash for defence uh, is very low. We do spend 2.2% currently, which is above the NATO, although that is including George Osborne's cooking the books during the coalition era when he decided that actually pensions and a whole load of other non-frontline spending would suddenly be counted as part of the defence budget, whereas previously it wasn't. So mm. there's a reason that our allies are slightly aggravated. But the, 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 the Ministry of Defence has a point. 
right? And Susie is entirely right that defence procurement is, is a joke and that does need to be reformed. But we are reading, we've deployed one ship to the, the, to the Gulf of Aden to, to fight the Houthis. It can't fire on land because it has a gym where its missile silos should be because those missiles were never purchased. We have aircraft carriers, uh, IMOD, MOD chiefs are saying we might have to sell one and we still haven't got the jets for either of them. Mm. Don't so, have the RFA ships yeah. to actually supply them yeah, with Yeah, pre precisely. Got we, one and it's we, not working. So, so the, the, the armed forces are trapped because effectively for decades now, since the end of the Cold War, government after government has cut defence spending, but they've ducked the hard questions about what kind of military do you want with less money. So, in theory, we have a global blue water navy. In theory, we have an you know, army that's capable of doing everything. The RAF still exists for some reason. And none of it works properly because none of it has been properly funded. And that's going to continue. But in the current climate, is he likely to, to have the, the, the ear of um, Jeremy Hunt a little bit more because there are lots of wars going on? Yeah. I think if there was anything that looked like you know, a cut in real terms. So that you're still, say, if you're still having 2.2%, but actually next year it'll be slightly less than everyone was expecting, that kind of thing, then our allies, America in particular, would be really quite edgy. You know? And what we're doing in Ukraine certainly requires restocking the armament pile quite quickly and spending cash on that. So there's, they're going to have to find a way through the budget to actually get the spending to where our allies would like it to be. But I suspect if Mr Shapps is asking for 2.5% and it's currently at 22 they'll settle somewhere in the middle at 23 and a bit. Uh, and they'll find a way to juggle it and, you know, it, they'll, they'll say that we're giving them extra and it's the war in Ukraine aren't we looking tough and they'll find something they can sell politically um, for a focus group and something like that, but it will be words. So possibly a little bit more, but not exactly what they're asking. We'll be tackling the problems that Henry just outlined. Henry, take us to uh, daytime discos, uh, courtesy of the Women's Institute. <laughs> yeah, everyone's, everyone's laughing at this, but I, I, I've been to day raves, which is, you know, been what to we the call... Women's Institute. I have not been to the Women's a Institute. Rave it's, is... not for, it's not for me. A but, rave you know. is different to a disco. Uh, well, OK, fine. Uh, slightly <laughs> different generations, perhaps. But, uh, yeah, so the Women's Institute is organising discos, and it's, uh, it's from two, 2 to 8. So, basically, the idea yeah. is that you can, you can recreate the experience of going to nightclubs, uh, and then you can come out and all the trains are running, all the restaurants are still open, and you can get home in time and go to bed on time. Um, and you know what? <laughs> if you're not up for staying out until five or six, and I, I've come to understand that that does happen to people, um, <laughs> this, might be a, this might be a great experience. And, you know, there, there's a village near my parents' hometown where some retired Ibiza DJ every summer. He puts on something like this that starts early in the afternoon and it runs, admittedly, until about two in the morning. But... The, a lot of people who did go to discos and clubs when they were younger, they still want part of that experience, but they, for whatever reason, don't fancy stumbling out of Ministry of Sound at six, and this is a perfectly good substitute, Are you, are you looking in my direction? Um, you need to no. be aged at well, 30, 30 or over to be admitted. Does it, it sound like a good is, idea, Susie? Well, do you fancy in it? In theory, if, you th if that assumes, and this is from Henry's position of youthful optimism here that assumes that everything else about nightclubbing is brilliant, it's just the time of day that it happens that's a bit of a drag. And actually, by the time I think you get over 30, most people other than Henry would be starting to say, especially if you're women, just going, I don't know where those shoes anymore. I, I can't get myself in that frock anymore. I'm tired of shouting at people and getting spat at by people and smelling other people's farts while we all try to pretend that we like this. <laughs> well, that's because you can't um, smoke in there anymore. And you can't smoke in there anymore. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. everything else, like, just, there's so you're much not, other to the right discos. Nose for blue drinks and stuff. It's against, you know what, no. You get to the point where none of it is actually any it's fun. It's not a disco for people who hate going out, right? <laughs> like, 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 that's not the target. I, I, I have been out nightclubbing. I have rocked the pole in a few places and it just gets to the point where you go, do you know what? Well, I mean, it doesn't no say that that's in more. I've had Henry, I think you need to introduce Susie to some different uh, nightclubs. Yeah, yeah, we need to go raving. Definitely. She's had no, a, I'm not had... a raver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. You, you can be. Girl. That's, that's a definite no. <laughs> Susie we'll and Henry, thank you so much.